There you go, ma'am. Thank you. All I can say is hold on to your hats, all right? Good morning. God bless you. Gene and I feel like we are, I guess we're old enough to be called grandparents here. We feel like we just visit our Ohio family when we come here. So why don't you give yourselves a big hug this morning? That's from Grandma and Granddaddy. It's just an honor to be here to share the gospel with you. We certainly uh, connect with you. We connect with Pastor Ken and Angel and your leadership here. You have been very gracious and kind to receive us. And Gene just felt it would be wisdom to give his wife the first word so that he would have the last word. I think he... <laughs> I think men like the last word, so uh, <clears throat> that's why we're going to do it this way this morning. But let's just open ourselves now to the voice of God, because this pulpit is not a piece of furniture. It is the voice of God to his people, and I honor this pulpit and the voices that have spoken from here, and we want the Holy Spirit to speak as only the Holy Spirit can. So let's just open ourselves now to the moving of the Holy Spirit. Dear Father, we thank you today that we gather here as your people, and you've sent the Holy Spirit to help us. So Holy Spirit, we open ourselves to your presence and to your moving. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you desire to hang out with us this morning, that you desire to do your supernatural workings, and I give you permission, Holy Spirit, to go far beyond anything I purposed or planned or thought about. We want you, Holy Spirit, to make yourselves known. So we set aside life, we set aside our thoughts, all those things that would interfere, and we open ourselves now to you, Holy Spirit. Come and have your way. Come and do what only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It was probably around uh, November or December of this year, during the holidays, I was in my kitchen early in the morning, just doing what you do in a kitchen early in the morning, kind of straightening up from breakfast, wiping the counters. I was in no way in a spiritual mood. I was not praying or seeking God's wisdom for the day. I was just sort of humming to myself, cleaning up the kitchen. And as I was doing that, a, a, a scripture rose in my heart. I knew it to be a scripture because I had spoken from this scripture in times past. I even knew where it was in the Bible. It was from Psalms 85, verse 6. And it says, will you not revive us again that your people, O Lord, may rejoice in you? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? But I, I did not hear that as a scripture. I actually heard that as a voice. I understood immediately that it was the Holy Spirit, God himself, talking to me. And I understood that uh, it was not an invitation to go read my Bible. It, it was not an invitation to uh, go immediately into prayer. That God had just supernaturally dropped this into my heart. I do a conference every February, and uh, I normally will begin praying about what I'm going to say in that conference at the end of December, but it was as if God just put something deep within me, and I knew that what was coming out of me was not going to be a message per se, because I am a teacher, if I understand it. I can teach it to you in a way that you understand it. That's a calling on my life. But I understood from this moment in my kitchen that it was not so much about a message, 
but rather it was about something that God intended to do. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Now that was probably around uh, November, December, and I just sort of held that in my heart knowing that God intended me to minister from that scripture because of something God wanted to do. Then in the early weeks of February, we began to hear about revivals that were occurring on college campuses, people gathering supernaturally in Kentucky, and it, it sort of began to spread out. And I understood that God knew what he was talking about in November and December, that God intends to revive his people because his people need reviving. And it was going to be a move of God. Now, our problem with, with that word is we normally make it something global. We normally make it something really big like what we've been hearing in the newspapers, what we've been seeing on our television. And certainly, I don't negate that. Those large global moves of God. I'm where I am today because of one of those revival moves of God. The charismatic renewal began in 1967 when two Catholics in Pennsylvania began to speak with other tongues. And that became a global revival. And people such as myself were born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues, and it's historically known as the charismatic renewal. I, I am where I am today because I was a part of this global revival. But I understood from the scripture that God spoke to me, that uh, this was not something global. This was not something God was desiring to do through me globally, even though there are those big outreaches of God, that this was very personal. This was very uh, simple, one-on-one -on -one ministry from God. And certainly we understand God is a God of revival, but revival is a power of God that is very personal. It does not have to show up in a large auditorium with thousands of people. In fact, when the psalmist wrote our text scripture in Psalm 85 verse 6, it's not praying for a you know, massive outpouring of God. He just said, God, will you not come again? Talking about a people who know God. Will you not come again and revive us? And, and it's a very powerful thing that God does in revival. And it does not have to be overly dramatic. And sometimes we think for God to be powerful he has to be very dramatic, very uh, upfront with, with the manifestations of his power. After Jean and I were baptized in the Holy Spirit, we joined a Pentecostal church, and they were Pentecostal. They used to say it this way, from the top knot to the toenail, we're Pentecostal. And they were Pentecostal. They jumped, they shouted. They ran through the buildings, and it was very manifested in their, their demonstrations of their love of God. We didn't do so much jumping and dancing and shouting, but they did. And we had children. Our boys were young then, and that was a church they grew up in. So one day, my little son Mark comes to me. He's just a little kid. I'm stirring a pot on the stove. And I can't quit stirring because it'll stick and ruin if I quit. And he came up and said, Mother, I have a headache. Would you pray for me? So I put one hand on his head, kept looking at the pot, stirring. And I said, Father, heal him in Jesus' name. Amen. Grabbed the pot, kept stirring, and Mark stood there. So I turned and looked at him. And he said, Mother, I meant really pray. 
really pray, Mother, and I knew what he wanted. So I took the pot off the stove, and I got in my Pentecostal crouch, <laughs> and I did my eyes in little slits, and I started speaking in tongues, King Dora, real loud, King Dora, and I began circling him, and he was circling with me, you know. <laughs> And all of a sudden, I jumped and grabbed him in the midsection, and I said, you foul demon of headache, come out of him. And I shook him like those Pentecostals did. And then I hit him on the back, be healed, be healed, be healed. And I knocked him across the kitchen, and he's leaning against the refrigerator, and I'm holding him to the stove. And he stood up, and he said, now, Mother, That's what I mean by pray. I already feel well, Mother. I already feel well. (laughs) And we think God has to be that way. You know, we want God to show up when we say revival and beat on us and knock us across the room and, you know, just, just do something to let us know that God is in the room. But dear people, there there is a a power of God. That, that is called a revival is very personal to, to each one of us, to all of us who call ourselves this Sunday morning the people of God. The psalmist says, God, will you not re- revive us again? And we understand in the last several years, we've been through very bad years. We've been through times of upheaval, We've had to confront things that prior to 2019, 2020, we didn't even have a name for them. COVID, uh, all these new phrases, transgenders, uh, just, just this world that has gone in a direction that has been very difficult for all of us. We, we've come through uh, times of sickness, The country was shut down for a period of time. We haven't yet returned to what we would call back to normal. I don't know that we will go back to what was once normal. We have to admit that we are in what the Bible calls end times. Someone said to me, do you believe these are the last days? I said, well, I'm 83, so for me, they are the last days. (laughs) I said, I don't know how many more I've got, but uh, I said, I'm living like they are the last days. And I think even you young people need to live like these are the last days. We certainly are, are in end times. And we have to understand that we as God's people need the, this personal touch of God that is called revival. It, it has nothing And certainly I don't negate what goes on on our college campuses. I'm all for that kind of move of God. But this is not what the psalmist is saying. Uh, In our culture, electricity is very powerful. The electrical grids run the, the globe. And electricity, we understand, is a power. We don't think a lot about it. Until electricity is not in our home, and then electricity becomes very personal because it's no longer empowering our home. And this is the way I want you to think today about this issue of God reviving us again. In Habakkuk 3, verse 2, it says, O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. Now, the midst of the years indicates distance. And one of the images God has put in the Bible of us, his people, is we are long distance runners. The Bible calls it the race, the marathon, long distance. God who begins a good work will finish it. And God intends every one of us as his people to make it to the finish line. He intends us to uh, run the race and to come to the end and cross the finish line. But in order to do that, there has to be this power of God 
that comes to us, reviving us. The Bible said, revive us in the midst of the years. And there's no one who's lived long years that doesn't understand somewhere in that distance from beginning to end, you need God to step in and revive again. The reason we old people cry when we go to weddings, we're not crying because we're happy. We're crying because we know what's ahead. <laughs> we know what it's like. I know what it's like to be married 63 years. I know what that's like. And somewhere in those distances, there has to be some kind of revival work. Gene and I sleep in a king-sized bed, and we're edge dwellers. He sleeps on his edge, and I sleep on my edge in the gulfs between us. And we like that. We enjoy that. And one night, we get in bed, and from his edge, his voice said, uh, I forgot to kiss you goodnight. And from my edge, I said, yes, you did. There was a long silence. <laughs> And then he says, roll over here and I'll kiss you. <laughs> and I said, I'm too tired to roll over there. You roll over here and I'll kiss you. And he said, well, I'm in my sweet spot. I don't want to move. So we just threw kisses. And so sometimes when you've been married 63 years, you need reviving. It's called the, the second honeymoon, uh, getting away for, for a season. Any church congregation full of members who've been here in the midst of the years, you need God's power to come again and to minister to you. There's probably been uh, two times in my life that I really wanted to quit uh, one was at the beginning of my ministry when I was going through a, a physical problem. And the other was probably about 2008 or 9, when best friends kind of stabbed me in the back, people that I thought would be with me for years. And the frustrations of that, the frustrations of the physical when I was much younger and the frustrations of the herd of friends that I felt had really betrayed me. Uh, just made me at a point want to throw my hands up and quit. And had it not been for God's reviving power, I would have quit. And I am an evidence of the personal need each of us have for God to come again and to touch us with his power. Isaiah 11, 11 says, the Lord shall set his hand the second time to recover. So this is why God would come to us in revival. Uh, Isaiah wrote about it, God setting his hand the second time to recover, indicating that in the midst of the years, things can get lost. You can lose things. There can be things that happen. That word recover literally is defined uh, to return to what it should have been, what it once was. To recover is to regain possession of it, to recapture what was once yours, to reclaim and to set it right. So when God comes to us the second time, he, he's understanding in our lives that, that in the midst of years, in the midst of our walks with God, we can lose things. Uh, things are not right. Life does its work. People have input that can hurt and take us off course. And then, of course, there's the whole invisible spiritual warfare that goes on in the heavenlies and is projected into the earth, the, the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of darkness. So there is this power that comes to us that recovers. 
uh, makes things what it should be, returns things back to what God intended, uh, regaining possession of something that was lost, recapturing, reclaiming, setting it right. In Isaiah 42, God was speaking about his people, in this case, the Israelites, in verse 22. He says, this is a people robbed and ruined. They're snared in holes. They're hid in prison houses. They are a prey for attacks. And there's nobody saying restore. And so we come to the second aspect of why God's revival power would come to us again. And it's there are things that have to be not only recovered, but restored. Restored suggests a, a shattering. Restored means to uh, put it together again. That which is torn and broken and ruined and snared and robbed, that God is able to come and in his revival power, he can give it new life and restore it to what it once was. And I think those two words are very powerful for us who are here on a Sunday morning. Because basically our issues here aren't, uh, you know, our, our personal relationships with God. But it is that we have done life in a world, and in a world that is going completely contrary to Jesus Christ, and we all have our testimonies of the difficulties of the days that we have been through. I, I have personal friends been through sickness, death, uh, suicides, tragedies, uh, just these things that only God's hand can come and revive it and put it where it, it is in a, a powerful, healed place. Luke 19, verse 10 says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. I want us to focus on that word, lost. And we read that, and we, we just say, well, he's come to seek sinners. People who do not know Jesus Christ are lost. And certainly, Jesus Christ came to seek sinners. But that's not what the scripture says. It says the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And if we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, we understand the, the scope of Luke 19 and 10 because in that incident where a woman ate fruit that was forbidden and then gave it to her husband and he ate, and a serpent, the devil, was in the middle of all of it, God lost. He lost Adam. He lost Eve. He lost the human race. He had given them dominion over all of the earth, the good that God had decreed, that everything would be good, everything would go as it should. God was on the outside looking in. And God lost people. He, he lost his whole plan. It had gone astray. And had it not been for the cross of Jesus Christ, it would still be lost today. Thank God for the cross of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ came, and he was not just seeking lost people. He was talking about everything that God himself had lost. There, there should have been the dominion of God. And God is still working in 2023 toward that end that his kingdom will come and his will will be done in the earth, yes. just like it's done in heaven. That is the promise of scripture. And that is still being worked out. And, and when we are uh, alienated, when we, God's people, don't finish, when we don't do what God intended us to do, when we drop out, 
pull back, God loses us. Had I quit those two times, I wouldn't be here today. Not that God's kingdom would have lost. He's got someone better than me in the uh, foyer out there. But he would have lost me. And dear people, I want you to know one thing. God wants you. God came to save you. And God wants you to go the distance. John 6, verse 12, Jesus was feeding uh, a multitude of over 5,000, 5,000 men, women, children. And he took a little boy's lunch, five loaves and two fishes, and fed the multitude. And when they had finished eating, what, what was left over was on the ground, you know, just scattered. Uh, they multiplied the, fi the fish and the bread. And Jesus said to his disciples, I want you to gather up the fragments that nothing be lost. Because the, the purpose of the Son of God coming to the earth is that nothing be lost. Now, who cares about leftovers? Jesus did. He said, I don't want anything to be lost. And they began to gather up the leftovers, these broken pieces of fish and bread. The Bible said there were 12 baskets that were left over. And Jesus had them gather every bit of that up. And he tells us why, that nothing be lost. And so when we do life, you know, life can just hit you in the belly. Uh, people in life can just hit you in the belly. You can go to the doctor and get a bad report and it hits you in the belly. You go through divorce and it hits you in the belly. And life can become fragmented. Uh, instead of whole and complete, there are those pieces that, that were leftovers, things that can stay with you for years, things that can uh, hang on to your life forever, the fragments uh, of what life can do. Uh, when those best friends did what they did, uh, I, I don't know how to describe it. These were people that had been in my life for 21 years. Uh, I, I turned my back on them. Uh, I, I would have thought they'd have gone the distance with me. I would have thought if we had to, we would have died for each other. And I don't know what happened to this day. I don't know what happened to them. But it was just a knife in the back. And I was very fragmented. And I'll tell you, that the leftovers of that were more tormenting than what they did because I couldn't get it out of my head. At night, I would think about it when I'd lay in the bed. And I'd think, well, if I wasn't a Christian, this is what I'd say to them. It would run through my head, uh, just, you know, these things, because I'm a pretty good girl with one-liners that can leave you not knowing what to say. Uh, one of the people involved in that, Gene had brought him dentures because when he came to our church, he had one tooth, and Gene bought him dentures. The church bought him dentures. And uh, Gene taught him how to work the computers, and he sent a nasty email, and I said to Gene, he wrote that on a computer you taught him how to use. And he's telling us he's you know, leaving because, and he had no reasons. And I read the little letter, and I said, well, email him back and tell him when he leaves to drop his teeth in the offering plate <laughs> as he exits. Now, that's how ugly I can be. I can come up with these one-liners that, you know, or if you need good stuff, I got it. If you need something to put on Instagram today, I've got it for you. I've got the one-liners that... Because I grew up in a family like that. They'd just leave you with your mouth open and think, that was good. Boy, that was good. <laughs> Wish I'd have said that. That was good. <laughs> but how I many know we, we're Christian? We're Christian. And I'll tell you people, the leftovers of that lived in my life for two, three years. 
And one day I just got tired of it. And I said, God, I, I forgave them way back here because I had to. I had no options. God tells me I have to forgive them, and I forgave them. But the fragments, and it took the reviving work of God to make me whole again. That I can see them without anger in my heart. Can think about them now without wanting to say ugly things to them. Uh, the, the power of God's revival uh, touching us because we need recovery. We need restoration. Will you not revive us again that we can rejoice in you? Fragmented lives, you lose the joy. You lose the peace. You lose the love. Uh, there, there are just a lot of things that fragments can take from God and can take from God's people. Joel chapter 2, verse 25 goes even beyond just incidents in life that God needs to touch. There's a promise there. It says, I will restore the years to you that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the canker worm. Who can restore years? God. I can restore the years. You know, I'm a grandmother now. I have two sons. I, I'm a great-grandmother. And I said to Jean not long ago, I said, would to God I had had babies now because I'm so much wiser than I was in my 20s. I said, I know how to raise kids now. And I didn't know diddly poo back in my 20s about being a mother. We didn't have any information Back then, we didn't have, uh, you know, emails and books, and uh, we couldn't go to Google and find out what it was like to birth a baby. Three months before I had my baby, I went to the hospital with my aunt, who was having her second child, and I was horrified when I went into the birthing room and saw what women had to do. And I came home and told Jean, I said, uh, this is going to be pretty bad. I said, I'm going to be in intense pain, and at some point I have to push this baby out. He said, can you do that? I said, I have to do that or I'll die. <laughs> I got no choices here. In those days, men sat out in the hallway, and Gene says, thank God they did. He didn't want to be a part of that. The years. The years. Who in here doesn't look back on the years? And say, oh, if I had known then what I knew now, fruitless years. When you put in a lot of effort and you got very little back, just fruitless. Go to work and work hard and very little return. Painful years, sickness, death, uh, broken relationships, divorce, family problems, selfish years. When we all just went and did stupid. And we won't be spiritual this morning. Everybody in the room does stupid. You just, you just do things you shouldn't have done. Misdirected years. Making wrong decisions. And of course, sinful years. Which never, never work. So all of us are here today. Some of us have more years than others. But God says to us that so powerful is this revival that he can go back and he can touch those years and he can make life now what it should be in spite of what those years were. Uh, probably back in uh, 2009 or 10, a young woman, she was newly married, came to a conference where I spoke and I, I, <clears throat> I prayed with her and she was baptized in the Holy Spirit during that conference. And probably a few months later, her husband worked for Delta Airline, and they transferred to the Atlanta, Georgia area and actually lived in the area where our, our church was. And she knew me from the conference, and she came to me as just a young woman in her 20s, 
married at that time with no children. And Jennifer has been with me nearly uh, 30 years. I think she says 27 years. She and I have been together. Uh, Jean has been her pastor in those years. And Jennifer came to us, even though she was born again, and even though she was baptized with the Spirit, her father had sexually molested her, beginning at a very young age. He sexually molested her sister, and when her sister became too old, Jennifer was his next choice. And he molested her until she left home at age 18. And at that point, she, her testimony is she lived a very uh, wild uh, life, promiscuous drinking. Uh, she just went the bad route because of what her father had done. But she encountered Jesus and was born again. And she encountered the power of the Holy Spirit and was baptized in power, and then she came to us and became a faithful church member, attending every service except when she could not be there. And her testimony is that God at the beginning gave her Joel 2.25, I will restore the years. And she said in her testimony to her the years of what her father had done to her. And that God, she didn't understand scripture. She didn't understand what God was going to do. And I don't have time to give her testimony. Uh, she, she does give it. But God reached back into those years. And God was able to take the horror of the fragmented life that her father had produced in her. And God brought her from that destructed beginning to the powerful woman of God she is today. She's our children's pastor. Totally, completely, 100% healed and delivered of every evil because God is a God of revival that doesn't just leave you fragmented, half healed, barely making it hanging on for dear life. He is a God who wants to restore and wants to recover. Uh, In in Genesis chapter 4, verse 25, it said Adam knew Eve, meaning he had a sexual relationship with Eve, his wife. He knew her again, and she bore him a son, and she named him Seth. Now notice this last sentence. For she, for God said, she, for she said that God said, he has appointed me another seed. And it doesn't matter what life does. Because here's this woman <clears throat> that has made a major mistake. And there's no recovery for her. I mean, she ate the fruit. She gave it to her husband. They're living on the east side of Eden. And when we read this scripture, one of her sons has murdered the other son, and the murdering son is an outcast. And here's this woman in the midst of this loss. She had lost everything. Her life was fragmented. Her relationship with her husband was fragmented. I mean, everything that God intended was gone And yet God gave her another seed. And the ultimate outplaying of that ultimate seed is the cross of Jesus Christ. Because in Psalm it says, I will restore that which I took not away. The reviving power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, The reviving power working like only the Holy Spirit can. Now, Jean and I are in our latter years. uh, You know, I said the other day, I said, you know, so many of our friends are dying. And he said, well, Jean, we're in our 80s. People in their 80s die. I said, well, I guess you're right. We're at that age. But, you know, even though we're in our latter years, it doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit can't revive 
The Holy Spirit can't renew. The Holy Spirit can't give you a new, fresh energy, power, anointing of the Holy Spirit. We went to see our doctor, not because we were sick, it was our checkup. And so he spent an hour with us, and we're sitting, you know, in front of his desk. He looked at us, us and he said, well, you're doing pretty good, aren't you? And we said, yeah, we are. He said, well, I can tell you are. You're walking good. You're making sense when you talk. You know, he just went through this list of things. We said, yeah, we can make sense when we talk. And he said, well, you know, the medical profession has a name for people like you. And he said, we call you the super agers. Well, I liked that. Much better than the old agers. (laughs) And uh, we said, well, why would you call us that? He said, well, medically, we believe that humans should be able to live to be at least 100. And we're trying to figure out why they, they don't. And he said, if you watch it, he said, a lot of people will begin dying before they reach 80. And he said, but yet there are people like you that reach 80 and you're doing good. And he said, you, you've kind of plateaued. And even though you're aging, you're, you're still just kind of doing good. Uh, he called it on cruise control until you just cruise right on out of here. That was the way he said it. And I thought, uh, I know why we're super agers. Dear people, it is the power of the reviving work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, this personal, every day, showing up every day, renewing us, invigorating us, giving us his anointing, his power. Now, God spoke to me when I prayed about this service, that there's going to be a reviving work of God done here this morning. And I felt like there were things here people had lost. You've lost money. Maybe you're sick. You lost your health. I felt like there were people here fragmented. Life had punched you in the belly. People had punched you in the belly. Uh, You're living in the leftovers of that, hard to get rid of it. Some of you, life was interrupted when COVID came and you've never returned back to normal, to the way it should be. Your jobs were affected. Your money was affected. Uh, some Some are snared in prison houses. Things happening, you can't shake it off. Sometimes it's tragedy, sexual abuse, death, uh, this, this thing of the years, things that happened a long time ago that want to stay with you. I want us all to just lay our hands on ourselves this morning. And I want us to realize God spoke to me. There's a reviving power here this morning. And if you've lost something, you lost money, you lost your peace, you lost a job, uh, the years that needed to be restored, I want you just to stand to your feet right now. You're going to claim it. Something fragmented you. Just stand up where you are. And let's believe for God to restore. Just just stand up. If we can, we'll gather around the altar. Uh, Why don't you just come up to the altar? We won't try to line you up. Just gather around here. Gene, if you'd come up with me. Gene and I are just going to pray a prayer. Just gather up close. If you stood. I really, I really feel this. I don't want you to, uh, I don't want you to overlook today. It's going to be, uh, it's very personal. God gave me this word for you. The reviving power of the Holy Spirit can come up just a little bit. So those coming behind, we're not going to try to lay hands on you. That's why I had you stand. And there are just too many of you. But Gene and I are going to pray. And we're going to believe God's hand will touch you. Is that all right? God's hand will touch you. Uh, This sister right here, you right here, honey. Uh, God said he's got another story that he's going to write for your life. And you haven't yet gotten into this new chapter. And God said, uh, you know how when you read a book, you come to the end of a chapter and you think, well, 
That's the end of the chapter. You know, I'm at the end of this chapter and you don't know how it's going to end. Well, God said in this next year, you're at the end of a chapter and God's turning a brand new page and there are going to be some things that are going to spring forth in this page that will surprise you about yourself because God is going to do such a work in you that even people who know you today will look back and say, you're not who you used to be and God is just going to do a work of restoration, a work of restoration. Now, I'd like you that came up, just close your eyes and focus on God to close your eyes and to understand that God is touching you and, and to know that, that God gave me this word for you, that God will revive again. We thank you, God. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Now, Father... Uh, as we pray here, we want you to hear what we say. I'm going to read this scripture again, and then I'm going to lead you in a declaration of faith. It says in Isaiah 42, verse 22, this is a people robbed and ruined. They are snared in holes. They're hid in prison houses. They are prey, and nobody says restore so I'm going to lead you, and with the power of your words, we're going to break the hold of everything that is represented in this prayer line. And I want all of you who come up here to say this after me, and then at the end, we're just going to shout with victory, revive me again, restore. Now say this after me. I will no longer stay silent. I will no longer stay silent. I will no longer live. I will no longer live. As robbed, as robbed ruined, ruined, snared, snared in prison houses, in prison houses of, loss. of loss. The grace and favor of God is over my life. The grace and favor of God is over my life. I lose the hand of God to touch my life. I lose the hand of God to touch my life. Touch me, God, the second time in revival power. Revive me again that I can rejoice in you. I speak restoration and recovery to the dry places, to the dry years, the lost years, the fragmented years. Revive me again, O oh Lord. Restore. Restore. Now shout that. Restore. 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 In Jesus' name. Father, we lay our hands over this part of the altar, these people who came up. We thank you, God, for our work of restoration. We thank you that the years that were lost, the fragments of life, what was done by the enemy people, even by our own stupidity. Restore, oh God. Restore, oh Lord. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, my brother in the blue shirt right here, the Lord has a path that he wants you to walk. Uh, it's a path that you cannot find by yourself. It's a path that's only known to God. Only God has the road map, the Google, all of the, the dimensions of it. And God brought you here today so you can leave behind this old thing. And God's going to take you in a new way from this day forward. The old has passed away. It is a new day for you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord. Lord, this center section right here, we stretch our hands toward them. Jean and I stretch our hands, and we say restore, recover. Everything that was lost, restore and recover. Go back into the years, Lord, and don't let any of us leave here today fragmented, broken, Restore and recover. In Jesus' name, this right side, we stretch our hands and we believe there's restoration. There is restoring. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Uh, in, in the black, uh, 
I, I just see God, it's like, uh, it was like a puzzle that was on a table. And I don't know what happened, but something just came along and all the pieces went flying. And you just haven't been able to put the pieces back together again. It was like something just knocked it over and you just couldn't put the pieces back together again. And God's not only going to put the pieces together again, he's going to make it till it's whole, it's well, it's tight, and it'll never be knocked over again. Fear not, the Lord works for you in Jesus' name. And Father, we just pray over uh, Kopi Church in general that the work of revival, the power of the Holy Spirit, everything that you have imagined and thought and dreamed and spoken over this congregation, you will revive it again, and they who have begun a good race will finish it in Jesus' name.